All right, our next speaker is, is Jared McLean, who recently completed his PhD at Harvard in chemical physics under the advi advisement of Dr. Alan Aspora Guzik. As of Monday, Dr. McLean will begin work at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs as the Luis W. Alvarez Postdoctoral Fellowship, as fellow, and this is after completing his practicum at Los Alamos. All right. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, I'm really happy to be here, this ultimate culmination of the many years of this fellowship that I've greatly enjoyed and greatly enjoyed interacting with all of you. So today I'd like to tell you about a little bit of what I did in my PhD, which you know, I think it was alluded to a little bit earlier this morning that we need to think about a few new technologies for beyond CMOS occasionally. Maybe it, it doesn't seem like it's directly in line with HPC all the time, but I, I urge you to believe that HPC is not only crucial for the development of this technology, but is also something I think will be very complementary to it in the future. But more specifically today, I'm going to talk to you about how some of these experimental devices that you might have heard of called quantum computers might affect quantum chemistry. And so I'm sure for some of you in the audience, you know, you heard quantum twice in a title and you have never been in a quantum mechanics class or, you know, it's been five years since you've been in one. So I'm going to kind of introduce both of those concepts, hopefully at, in a way that everyone can understand why we'd want to do them. So what is quantum chemistry? So I don't think I could have gone after a better talk for introducing why we care about quantum chemistry and the applications that it can give us, some of the real benefits that we have here. So what is it? So given some loose idea of a structure, maybe you know exactly where the molecules are, maybe you have a protein structure, some database, I would like to determine just from this structure almost all of its properties. So if I make some absorption graph of how it interacts with light at different wavelengths, I can understand how it starts to absorb light. If I know how it complexes with other species and interacts, I can say how I predict, how I think it's going to react, how a, how a protein will fold. And if I can do some simulation of how it will talk to a surface, then I can start to understand binding and heterogeneous catalysis. And from that understanding, I'd like to develop control. So if I really know how and why things interact with light the way they do, hopefully I can start to design better photovoltaics, you know, get around the energy problems. If I know exactly how things complex in biological species, maybe I can prevent the misfolding of proteins, maybe I can inhibit some pathway that would have been detrimental to the lifetime of that organism. And if I really know how to deal with surfaces, maybe I can think about how to start getting platinum out of our catalytic converters. So these all sound like grand dreams, right? And quantum chemistry turns out to be a very tantalizing problem for an interesting reason, which is that we've already solved it, at least in principle. So there's a famous quote by Paul Dirac that often gets said in talks like these which are the underlying physical laws necessary for the mathematical theory of a large part of physics, and the whole of chemistry are thus completely known, and the difficulty is only that the exact application of these laws leads to equations much too complicated to be soluble. And so the equation he's, of course, referring to is the Schrodinger equation, which, written in its most innocuous form, looks like this simple part of my slide right here, which is just a linear eigenvalue problem. So if I can solve this linear eigenvalue problem, I can tell you almost everything you would ever want to know about that benzene molecule. So a lot of you in the audience probably have backgrounds in applied math, computation. You're saying linear eigenvalue problem. Shouldn't the talk just stop here? Well, <laughs> turns out to be a little bit harder than that. And so why is this problem so incredibly hard to solve? So most of you are probably familiar with putting PDEs on a grid, choosing some sort of Galerican basis set. And maybe you go in Navier-Stokes from one, two, and three dimension. And every time you go from one set of grid points to the next dimension, you know that you add this extra. If there's m sites, once you add another dimension, there's m squared. A third, there's m cubed. So every time in quantum mechanics we add a, a particle, we tend to add one of these, one of these dimensions. And so what happens to the dimension of this problem is that if I have many, many particles, Despite it being linear, it is enormous in size. So what do I mean by enormous? I mean if I have 100 grid points and 80 particles, so we're not even beyond a few atoms yet, 
that means the dimension of this space is 10 to the 160. So there's probably no way you have a feeling for how big that number is, other than to say estimates of the known number of subatomic particles in the universe is 10 to the 80. So clearly, you're not going to be enumerating every single one of these basis functions and proceeding forward in that way. That is the origin of the difficulty in this problem, in summary. So what is the traditional solution? We, of course, we're scientists. We make approximations. We make reasonable approximations. And the most traditional in chemistry, you've probably already seen in an introductory chemistry course, but perhaps you didn't know it. It is just this molecular orbital diagram picture that says there is a single rank one approximation to this tensor that makes this problem tractable. And so solving this problem is more tractable, but it's not always perfect, right? There are sometimes issues with this type of solution. So what they probably didn't tell you in intro chemistry is that if you make this canonical picture for H2, and then you pull H2 apart, so this is just a diagram of if I take H2 and I pull it apart, that traditional, easy, intuitive solution tends to give you a very, very wrong result. And so if you're of the belief that chemistry involves the making or breaking of bonds, then you might, might want to be concerned about this, at least in some cases. So how do we typically go beyond this? We know how to go beyond this in chemistry classically. And it's to take one of these MO diagrams. So if you imagine that was the same type of picture I had before. And I enumerate every possible one of those states, just like the dimension argument I used before. And I solve this problem. We call it exact within a basis, uh, sometimes called full CI or exact diagonalization. And my result can be written in terms of some tensor, which we heard a lot about tensors earlier, which is this universe-sized object that I described to you before. So if we can solve this problem, we can get all the qualitative, quantitative results that we like, predictive materials, but this is an extremely, extremely hard problem, as you just noted. So of course, there are many approximation methods that have been developed classically. This is actually a somewhat old survey, but it stayed fairly true to how many atoms we can actually treat in such an exact manner. And we're down here you know, in the handful range, maybe somewhere between two to four, depending on if they're heavy or not. And other methods have gone up considerably. We can now do tens of thousands of atoms in DFT, for example. But they don't always give you perfect answers. So what you'd really like is the accuracy of a method like this one down here at the cost of a method up here. So that is the grand dream. But what approach am I going to take today? So I also told you I was going to use quantum computers. And actually, there was a different approach that was suggested by Richard Feynman back in the day. So he said, you know, you have this universe-sized object in this modestly drawn box. And you want to simulate all of it classically, but inherently you're simulating a quantum system. So what if instead of encoding that system classically, I encoded it in a different quantum system? So here's Richard Feynman expressing that idea. And really, it's something like a quantum marionette, I would say. So you're going to take particles and make them look exactly like the system that you would like them to look, and force interactions on them that make them evolve or perform actions that you would normally want to study, and then read this out. And roughly, this workflow looks like you engineer a Hamiltonian that's the generator for the dynamics of your system. You let the system down here explore naturally this process that you want to study without ever building a new classical representation of it. And at the end, you only measure interesting parts of your system. Instead of probing this enormous object down here, I only ask a very specific question, like what was the energy? Did this reaction happen? You know, is this process feasible? And just to universalize this, so a lot of different architectures now have been developed for quantum computing. You know, there's ion traps, there's quantum photons, superconducting qubits. Anything you can, anything you can have, two-level systems can be you know, a quantum computer in principle. So we abstract this with the notion of a qubit. So a bit can be 0, 1, and a qubit can be 0, 1, anything in between, and can also entangle itself with its neighbors or friends. And we write down the actions on these qubits by these gate notations, which are just unitary operations and have very convenient matrix representations that we can perform on these objects. So 
what was the big introduction of quantum computing into quantum chemistry? So my advisor in my PhD back in 2005 showed that if you use this algorithm called quantum phase estimation, which is essentially to prepare some quantum state of interest, evolve it forward, just like I said, so the quantum marionette, you make this system dance digitally for you, and you let it evolve forward in time, and then you perform a very specific measurement of only the energy, and this projective measurement of the energy collapses you into an energy eigenstate of interest. And so classically, this process is thought to take exponential time, and quantum mechanically, it takes something like the same cost as MP2 or the like. The challenge, of course, is that on quantum hardware we have today, even though this scaling is very nice, it might take millions of operations, and we can maybe perform 10 on our quantum device. So what I did was I took a new perspective, which is to say currently, you're given a task, you design a quantum circuit to perform it that's hopefully the best one you could possibly have. There's a big question mark whether it fits on your bl quantum blue gene P or quantum blue gene Q, and you get out the answer to life and everything. Unfortunately, this doesn't actually fit on many quantum devices today, and you'd like to think that there's something you can learn from those devices. So what did we do? We said, given the task and the current architecture, can I do something that is optimal for the resources that I am given and really have interplay between those resources and other things? And so that's what I'm going to describe. And to, to do this, you have to identify what is a quantum computer really good at. So the quantum computer is good at preparing these hard states and performing measurements. So I'm going to ask each bit if it's up or down. This sometimes has a projective measurement symbol, or it's sometimes written as these expectation values of poly operators. And this is efficient to perform on any state and is a key point in which there are some states which this is very hard to do classically for. And so I, to formulate this method, I'm simply going to go back to basics, and instead of writing my eigenvalue problem as linear algebra, I'm going to recognize it as a minimization over these weighted sums of expectation values. And what this lets me do is separate the tasks into things that are easy for a quantum computer and things that I can leverage my classical computer for that is still very fast at doing multiplications and additions. So after I've built it into these two parts, the algorithm is sim very simple. I'm just going to divide it up into what we call acutely a QPU, where we prepare some state. We perform all of the expectation values necessary for a particular molecule. We measure that energy, and it's going to give us some value. We feed that value back into a classical optimization. You could even use MATLAB's fmin function, since you now have a function value and you have a set of parameters. And it's going to feed back into your quantum device, leveraging the power of your classical computer to make parameter decisions and the power of your quantum computer to perform those hard-to-do measurements. And this kind of introduces an interesting idea in quantum chemistry and quantum physics, which is this idea of a quantum hardware on SOTS, which is to say if I have a complicated piece of hardware in my lab, one point of view is, oh, that's complicated. It's hard to understand. Another point of view is, look at all the cool things it can do without me even knowing the details of how it's done. So really the only requirement to this is that every time I give it this theta, it's returning to me the same answer. And I can still follow this variational paradigm to the best possible solution I can find given my device's limited resources, and today they are somewhat limited. And so we actually built this in a, a lab in the University of Bristol on a quantum photonic chip. This is about the size of a vanilla wafer. It's uh, we modeled the helium hydride in this, and you can see the QPU uh, set up here. And it's amazing that these same setups used to fill entire laser tables, and now we can do them in a few inch quantum optical setup, and the technology is only advanced from here. This is the only one I'll talk about, but we are working on several other expansive ideas in this direction. And the way it lines up with the hardware is my knobs, as I described. So every time I'm going in this loop, it's just, I'm just changing angles on beam splitters until I reach my optimal solution. So here we have this QPU where I'm injecting photons from the left. I'm measuring over here at the right. And my, quantum, my classical computer is deciding what new beam splitter angles should I be using. And so this curve may look somewhat unimpressive if you're a a normal quantum chemist because you would say, oh, look at all this noise on helium hydride. I can do this on my laptop to 16 digits of precision in a heartbeat. 
But really what this was was a demonstration with a real quantum device that even under very noisy conditions, so it's important right now that you don't require error correction for your quantum algorithm because it's very hard to get that with the resources we have today. And this was really a demonstration that without error correction, this algorithm got to within what we would determine as chemical accuracy or a, a kcal per mole or something like that if you're familiar with it. And Really, I just wanted to finish with hope for the future of quantum computing and really to get you all excited about it. And so this is a brief timeline where you can read about more in the, the article where it was published that just shows from the, it's only been since 1981 that this was first proposed. And today we have Google purchasing entire labs out of UCSD to build their own quantum computers. And this is just a short list, not complete, of the companies and organizations now funding and going forward with quantum computing efforts, including names like Google, Microsoft, IBM, Lockheed Martin for verifying airplane systems, which I think might be relevant to the next talk if you want to use a quantum computer. <laughs> uh, Department of Energy is, of course, funding it because I'm here and they have many other efforts as well. And with that, I'd just like to summarize and say that quantum computers offer an exciting new route forward. And we built a small scale implementation and tested it. And I hope you all are excited about it as I am for the, for the future. And with that, I'd just like to thank, of course, the CSGF for the opportunity to do all this work, for all the people I've been able to meet while I'm here, and the connections that it's helped me set up. I think this is a fantastic program, and I hope it continues strong for a long time. And of course, I'd like to thank my advisor and the collaborators that did the experiment. And with that, I'll take any questions.